parts. We look again this morning at uh, living the life we are called to live. And we, I spoke about this uh, th about a month ago now, isn't it? More than, yeah, about a month ago. It was uh, the week before I, went, before I went back to the States. And so we're going to continue with part two and we'll finish up the last, the con we'll conclude next week. Um, and we are looking at the passage in Philippians written by Paul and Paul's life goal. Do you have a life goal? Paul had a life goal. Paul's life goal was, in part, it, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. And that is how he's going to, that's his life goal, and it's also how he's going to reach his life goal. Because in the verses before that, Paul says, I want to know Christ. And when he says, I want to know Christ, he means every part of Christ. So this is where we began, and we looked at one or two parts a few weeks ago. So we continue this morning. And before we continue with the main passage, I want us to look at what Paul says after this passage in Ephesians 4 1 and we're going to look at um, the NIV and we see here in Ephesians 4 1 Paul writes after he has said this I want to know Christ he says as a prisoner for the Lord then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Okay, worthy of the calling you've received. Now, I have a question for you. How can we live a life that's worthy of the calling? Here's something that will help us to understand what Paul is talking about a little bit better this morning. And here's something that will also help us to evaluate our own lives. Because Paul can be an encouragement to us, but brothers and sisters, if we only look at the great Apostle Paul from 2,000 or so years ago and admire him and what he has done and his goals and his life, it does us no good unless we ourselves look at our own lives and we look at what Paul has presented to us as here is a way to live the life that God has called you to live and he does it very very clearly so we look at this just a little bit further and in Ephesians 4 1 he says I urge you he's a prisoner for the Lord when Paul writes this he's not just speaking uh, figuratively you know right now we could say we are prisoners for the Lord are you a prisoner for the Lord Yes, we, we are in his service. I, I hope we can say that. Um, or are we independent and free? No, I'm doing what I want to do. Yeah, Lord, I'll come on Sundays, but my life is mine. Um, the Lord still loves you, but if that's the way you're living your life, I promise you it's not the best life that God has for you. There's a better life. And so we can say, I'm a prisoner for the Lord. And when Paul says that, it has, he has two meanings. Because he means, my life is completely the Lord's. I'm his prisoner. In other words, I am completely under his control. But Paul means something else when he says this as well. When Paul writes this in Ephesians 4, 1, he is a literal prisoner as well, as well. He's behind bars as he writes this. So it's interesting to me that he's behind bars and then he writes to people who are not behind bars, who have a lot more freedom physically than he has. And here's what he says to them. I urge you, live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Now to help us understand what Paul is talking about a little bit more in this passage and the type of life we're to live, I want us to look at the word worthy for just a minute. So let's look at the word worthy. Worthy in the Greek, the Greek word is axios. Um, I don't know Greek, I just have a really good Bible program, okay? But worthy, it mean, it refers to a balance as on scales. So here's something for us to look at as we think about the lives we're called to live and as we think about our own lives. Here's a balance. So the, when Paul says, I urge you to live a worthy life, he says a life and it has to do with the balance of our lives. So when we have scales, and this is the word that's used here, or measuring or weights, what does that mean? When you are measuring something and when you have scales, is there something just on one side or is there something on both sides? There has to be something on both sides. If you go to the market now in Hong Kong, we do it sometimes, don't we? We use, there's a different type of scale, but in Hong Kong, in 
in China, when I lived there for many years, and probably for many of you back in the Philippines, we used a, a different type of scale, didn't we? It was always that long stick, and they would hold it up, and they would put weights on one end, and then they'd put the vegetables. Ah, you're all laughing because you know what I'm talking about, right? Um, and that was how you would weigh, that was how you would measure, you would balance what you were going to buy, and then you knew. Then you knew. So that's the picture for us. So think about it in this way as we think about our lives, if we're living worthy lives this morning. So this morning, put your life on one side of the scale. Huh? Okay, who's holding the scales? Who's measuring? God's measuring. And he always weighs accurately, doesn't he? He always weighs accurately. I can move out of the way. There we go. He always, so the Lord is holding the scales and we're balancing. And, and Paul says, are you living a life that's in balance? So your life is on one side of the scales. What's on the other side? What's on the other side? On the other side of the scales is the calling of God for your life. The calling of God for your life. For each one of you individually, because each one of us is different. Each one of us has a different background. Each one of us has different talents. Each one of us has different blessings in our life. Each one of us has different limitations in our lives. Some of us come from backgrounds that we had very few advantages or very few benefits. Others of us come from backgrounds where we had every advantage, every benefit, well provided for. And so here's this balance. In one is your life. In the other is the calling of God for your life. Whatever your age. You cannot say this morning, well that's for old folks. You cannot say this morning, well, that's for those who are more mature than I am. It's for every one of us this morning, whatever your age. The youngest person here right now, David, that's you. You're the youngest person because the, the kids went out, so the youth are here. That's David. It goes all the way up to the oldest person as well. Who would that be? <laughs> you know. It includes all of us. And no one is exempted. And so, brothers and sisters, not one of us, I like to joke about that, you know I love my co-pastor. You know that. <laughs> you know that. But it, does, it, it includes all of us. And not one of us, when we look at it in this way, not one of us can say, I have been too, my life has been too difficult. Not one of us can say, I have had too many hardships in my life. Not one of us can say, I have been too poor. I have been, been too disadvantaged. I have been too restricted in my life. Nobody can say that. Because the measurement of God is your life and his call on your life. You don't compare yourself to anybody else's life. So for me, wow, I don't know about you, but that gives me pause. That gives me something to think about this morning as I come to this passage. And so I don't have any excuses, and you don't have any excuses either. Well, I'm this, or I'm that, or I was hurt as a child, or I was abused, and, and that's not making light of the terrible things that have happened to anyone in their past. But what it does mean is God knows you and he knows your life and he has called you. And so in those scales, in that balance, is your life and the call of God in your life. And so are you living a life worthy of the calling you have received? And when we look at the way we are supposed to live and the, and, and the lives God has called us to live, for me, that makes a huge difference as I come to the Word of God. Does that, does that help you a little bit as you look at that this morning? I know for me, as I looked at that and I studied it yesterday, because that was for the first time yesterday, I understood, oh, the word worthy means a balance, living as a balance. And so we look at that. So Paul says that. You see, we look at Paul, and if we were to look at Paul's life, wow, Paul had 
religiously, spiritually, had so many more advantages than you and I, didn't he? So well trained um, in the word, a godly family as far as we know because of the path that he took, zealous in his personality and in his character. But Paul doesn't tell us, compare your life to mine. Paul says, you live your life in balance with the call of God on your life. And so that gives us something to, that gives us a framework as we look at what Paul says this morning. So now we go, the next slide, into Philippians 3, 10 through 16. And this is the passage. Uh, Paul says, I want to know Christ. That's his goal. Part of that goal is I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. And that's that picture again. And we understand in Paul's life that God grabbed Paul on that road to Damascus with a powerful grip. And Paul understood the grip of God on his life. And so Paul, in return, because he's living a worthy life, a life of balance with the call of God, Paul, with all that he has, is also reaching forward and straining forward to grip Jesus in the same way that Jesus has gripped him. Jesus has gripped you as well, brothers and sisters, whatever your age, whatever your background. And my question, it's which is similar to the living the worthy life, is are you straining forward and pressing forward to grip Jesus in the same way that he has gripped you? Or are you just kind of floating along, uh, sailing along, just kind of saying, well, God will take care of me. I've got things to do. That's not the picture that Paul gives us as we look and as we read this passage. And so he says, I haven't obtained it yet. Wow, if Paul can say that, I can certainly say it as well. Sometimes as a pastor and as for coming from a Christian family, I get a little bit complacent and I can get a little bit proud. You know, I look at my spiritual heritage, a very godly family, mother and father, very godly grandparents. Um, especially on one side, but on both sides of the family. And then I look at, wow, I was a missionary. I've been a missionary all these years. Well, look, I'm a pastor. And I can get a little bit complacent. And then I read what Paul says. And Paul says, I haven't reached it yet. I'm mature. Really what this passage says is, I'm mature enough to know I'm not yet mature. That's really what he's saying. And the really mature Christian, the mature Christian will know, I still have further to go. I haven't made it yet. And so this is what Paul says, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. And he helps us in this whole passage to do the same thing as we've been looking uh, a few weeks ago when we began this series. And as we look at this passage, it gives us keys, clues, and steps for how we too can live a worthy life in the balance and how we can grab Jesus in the same way that Jesus has grabbed us. And so, remember the two questions we were considering? The first question uh, was, the two questions that we ask ourselves, am I living the life God has called me to live? I can't answer that for you. Sometimes I would like to, and I'd like to look at your life and say, come on, you know, you're, you could do better. But you know what? You could say the same thing about my life, couldn't you? We could say the same thing about one another's lives. but So this question is a question for us to ask ourselves with the help of the Holy Spirit. If we do it by ourselves without the help of the Holy Spirit, we can either get proud because we can say, I'm surely doing better than you know who, or we can really condemn ourselves because some of us live with a lot of guilt. Some of us live with a lot of self-condemnation for whatever reason, and we look at ourselves and we always put ourselves down and we always say, I'm not good enough, I'm a failure, and I'm this and I'm that. So when we look at our lives, we have to look at our lives with the help of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit always does good things in our lives. Did you know that? He works in your life. He loves you so much. He's God. And He is at work never to harm and never to hurt, but always to bring good out of your life. And so we cooperate with Him and we work with Him and we talk to Him and He he talks to us as he works in our lives. So here's the first question. Am I living the life God has called me to live? I think most of us could say this morning, not fully. Would you say that this morning? Not fully? I would say that this morning. And then the second question is, how do I live the life God has called me to live? And that's what we've been looking at in the first time, and that's what we continue with this morning. I want to remind you of something by looking at the example of Eric Little again. This does not mean that you have to give up everything 
sell all your goods and go into full-time ministry. And we looked at the example of Eric Little, who, uh, and you can look at the next slide now. Um, Eric Little, some of you are saying, who's, is anybody saying, who's Eric Little this morning? That means you weren't here uh, three or so weeks ago. Eric Little was born in Tianjin, missionary parents from Scotland, and he won the 400 meter uh, race in the 1924 Paris Olympics. And he was the son of missionaries, and God had called him to be a missionary in, uh, in China. And after winning that race, a, about a year after winning the Olympics, the, a gold medal in the Paris Olympics, he returned to China, lived in China, gave his life in China when, when, uh, when, the, war, when the war was taking place, uh, the Sino-Japanese War. And Eric Little died in an internment camp in, uh, out, not in Tianjin, I think it was in Weixian or some, somewhere around there. And he could have been, we didn't go into all of this last time, um, but I it had encouraged you to read more about his life. In, in the camp, uh, in the months before the war, he didn't know it, but he had a brain tumor and he was, and he needed medical help. Um, and Winston Churchill secured his release from the, uh, from the camp as he was a prisoner there, and he refused and asked for others to be released instead of him. And he died in the camp. And um, uh, if you'll look at the Lighthouse Facebook page, you'll see Pastor Rene posted, they've, they have, you know, in China, they don't have a lot of statues up to people who are not Chinese, but they have one for Eric Little and for Norman Bethune, another uh, a Canadian uh, doctor who was there. Not many more than that, but he was acknowledged. And so some people say that the first, uh, the first Olympic medal uh, the first Chinese Olympic medal was Eric Little in 1924 because he was born, uh, because he was born in China. But we have this beautiful picture, and this was the example I gave you um, from his life uh, to understand how do we live the life that God has called us to live. He'd gone to university, just by way, just a very quick reminder, we do want to keep going. And I've added something to his, uh, I've, I've included what he quoted, uh, what he said. Uh, what we looked at last time was, Eric Little said when there was conflict about his life, because he was running, and he was winning, and his family and others said, yes, but God has called you. But Eric Little understood something about the call of God on his life, and he understood how God had made him. And he said, he said I believe God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast. And what he said after that was, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. Such a beautiful thing for us to under for him to understand about his life and for us to understand about our lives sometimes you and I feel unless we are working in the church that we're not pleasing God do you feel that way sometimes unless I am serving in the church unless I'm doing something for whatever then I'm not really pleasing God I don't believe that brothers and sisters I believe God has made us as we are in so many different ways with so many different different talents so many different skills and when we do what we do, and we do it well, whether it's in business, whether it's in the classroom, whether it's cleaning, or taking care of kids, or being a good father, or being a good mother, or being a good teacher, or student, or whatever, in any of these ways, we are living the lives God has called us to live. That's part of it. That's not the only part of it, but that's part of it. And when we do that, Oh, God help us to release us from condemnation. May we feel his pleasure. You say, Pastor Jennifer, I don't know if I can agree with that or not. Let me give you a verse that fully supports what Eric Little said. And it's found in, second, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. What does it say? Paul says, let's read it together. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. One more time. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Wow. Ah. So if you're studying, do it for the glory of God. Do it well. Working, cleaning, singing, whatever you do. Being a good husband, being a good father, a good mother, a good wife, all of these things. Do it for the glory of God. That's part of God's calling for your life, for your life. 
And if there's an area of your life where you say, I can't do that for God's glory, well, there's your answer as to whether or not you should be doing it, right? It surely is. That's an easy answer. Sometimes we wonder, is it okay to do this or not? There's an easy, there's, there's a question for you to ask yourself. Can I do this all for the glory of God? And if you say, yes, I can, then go for it. And if you say, hmm, hmm, then leave it out. Leave it out of your lives. So there's something for us to look at. Okay, so what's the first thing? Um, what's the first thing in this passage? Let's go to the first one and let's go to the main passage. Next slide again in Philippians 3, 12 through 13. And we look at these. We looked at this last time, so this is just very quickly. Here's what Paul says. He says, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved, the, already achieved these things. And then the second part of it, he says, no, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. And um, that's an encouragement because he says it two times, does it? He? he says, I'm not saying I've done this. And he says, no, I haven't achieved it yet. I've not yet taken hold of it. So the first thing we look at, if we're going to live the lives God has called us to live in this passage is, number one, a dissatisfaction with our lives as they are. Okay? So we can go ahead and click the top, a dissatisfaction. The top part. Click. There we go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Click. There we go. So the first one is a holy dissatisfaction. Something that says, I can do better. I can do more than I am doing now. And it is a dissatisfaction. He says, I haven't reached it yet. Brothers and sisters, if you and I are going to live the lives that God has called us to live, there must be a holy dissatisfaction with our lives. If not, we will settle down and we will say, good enough. We will look at other people and we will say, I'm doing better than that person is. Or we will look at others and we'll say, huh, they've got a long way to go. I've gone much further than they have. And we will settle down where we are. But remember, what we do and what we look at in that balance is there's our lives and there's God's call. Jesus on the other side. And when that's our balance, we will have a holy dissatisfaction in our lives. Now, some of us this morning would say, in my head, Pastor Jennifer, I agree with what you say, but in my heart, I don't feel it. Is that ever true of your life? It's true of my life. In my head, I know, God, I have further to go. But my heart sometimes is very satisfied. What can I do? That's one of the reasons we say, get into the Word of God. Spend time with Jesus. Because when we get into the Word of God, when we spend time with Jesus, then we see Jesus better, and we understand Him better, and then we see, okay, I've got further to go. And then our hearts begin to change. Our hearts begin to change, and when our hearts begin to change, and our heads know what to do, then we keep on moving. I had encouraged you last time as well. That's why I love to read Christian biographies, because Christian biographies give me practical examples of people who are really pressing on. That's why I really enjoyed reading about Eric Little and others, and it's a good thing to do. Okay, what's the next one? And we look at the passage again, and this time we look at a different part, and it's the same passage, but we've highlighted something else this time. He says, I haven't already achieved it. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. No, I've not achieved it yet, but what does he say? But I focus on this one thing, or one thing I do. One thing I do. So what's number two? First one is a dissatisfaction. Number two, click, there we go, is a devotion. A devotion. And devotion, I'm just using D words to help us to remember. It is tied up in that one thing or one thing I do. And this will help us to live the life that God has called us to live. Let's look at the scriptures again very quickly. Next slide, just a reminder. Here are four times that one thing is found in the Bible. And we see it in Mark 10, 21, when Jesus looked at the rich young ruler who had done so many good things, right? So many good things. But he says, he looked at his heart, he loved him. Ah! We could preach a whole sermon about that this morning. Jesus looks at a young man that has not yet 
followed the one thing that is not yet really devoted and he still loves him. May that encourage you this morning when you struggle with growing in God and when you fail and when you fall short. He looks at you and he loves you. And in loving you and in loving me, he will give us the direction. He'll say, you're still lacking here. One thing you lack, do this, do this. And so let that encourage us, Mark 10, 21. The next one is Martha and Mary. We know this one so very well, don't we? In Luke 10, 41 and 42, the Lord Jesus is, is teaching. Martha interrupts him with a complaint about housekeeping. Mm, wow. I do that sometimes too. And Jesus looks at her and he says, Martha, you're worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is important. And Mary has chosen what is better. I think that's how my life is sometimes. Do you think that your life is like that sometimes? We get wrapped up with a lot of things, right? Are the things good things? Yes. Are they things that we look at and we feel that they're quite necessary? Yes. I think so. A lot of times we look at these things and we think, well, these things really need to be. These things are important and these things are good. But when we hear the voice of Jesus, Jesus will help us to get our priorities straight, right? Oh, I think only Jesus can really help us. Jesus and the Holy Spirit will help us to get our priorities straight. Because I don't know about you, most of the time my life is not full of good things and bad things. Yeah? My life is full of a lot of good things, but I'm doing this, 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 and this. And so I need the voice of the Holy Spirit to tell me one thing, to point me to the one thing. And that's what we see here. So Martha's doing a good thing. He, she is. She's not doing a bad thing. She's not out there sinning. She's doing good things. She's serving Jesus, isn't she? She's serving Jesus. But Jesus looks at her heart and he says, there's one thing. There's one thing. Oh, may we listen to the voice of Jesus when he tells us there's one thing. There's one thing. Because when we get that one thing, then we'll be living the lives God has called us to live. The third one, John 9, 25, that was not from Jesus, but that was from a blind man who had been healed by Jesus. And he says, I don't know if he's a sinner or not. You see, the Jews were questioning him. Who healed you? Who is he? What's his name? Where is he? What did he do? And the man doesn't care about all these questions. What does he say? I don't know if he's a sinner or not. But one thing I do know, I was blind and now I see. I love that. Here's a person whose theology is very simple. We get complicated theology sometimes, don't we? All worked up. This man's theology is so simple. He says, I was blind and now I see. That's what I know. And as I remember, I think I mentioned it to you before, when, um, and Rosalind, you re may remember that, when we baptized Rosalind and Catherine many years ago at Stan Stanley, it was at Stanley, and I always, I still, and Catherine's in heaven this morning, I still remember what Catherine said when we baptized her. We gave each person an opportunity for, the, for a testimony to say what Jesus had done for them, what Jesus meant in their lives. And I remember, you know, Catherine was not a great theologian. Her English wasn't always great, so even though she came to Lighthouse, she didn't always understand a lot that was preached, but she felt love here and she was accepted here. And that's why I'm so glad Lighthouse was her church home because we loved her and she, she was accepted. But I remember her testimony that morning when we baptized her at Stanley. And she said it, there had been something wrong, I think, with her leg and with her foot. And I still remember Catherine said when we asked her to give her testimony, she didn't say, Jesus washed all my sins away and he brought me out of darkness and this and that. So simple. From her heart, she said, Jesus healed me. I believe him. That's what she said. And I think we've probably got it on a video somewhere. That's what she said. So simple. So simple. But do you know what? When she said that, she said the one thing that was needed. That's what she said. Jesus healed me and I believe him. And we baptized her. Oh, brothers and sisters, I think sometimes our Christian lives, we make it too complicated. It's a lot simpler than we make it at times. God help us to get back to the one thing, to have the devotion that keeps us straight. Psalm 27.4 was the last one. The psalmist David says, One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek. Oh, here's David, who was a king, who was a poet, who was a prophet, who was a singer, who was a shepherd, who was a warrior, who was a husband, who was a sinner. 
all of these things. And he says, one thing, one thing I ask of the Lord. God help us, brothers and sisters, to have one thing in our lives. Will all the other things still be part of our lives? Yes. Yes, all of these other things that are part of your life, you can't just lay them all aside. They're still part of your life. There are plenty of other things that you have to do in your life. But there can be and there should be a priority in our lives. There's a one thing. And so we look at the next slide. <clears throat> so devotion. And so we see again, he says, I focus on this one thing, one thing I do. Now, in the first point, I gave you the example of Eric Little, and I want to give you another, uh, uh, another great Christian as an example this morning, and I want to give you the example of D.L. Moody this morning. How many have heard of him before? Yes, D.L. Moody. So let's look at the next one. He's, he, you say, but he was from the 1800s. Yeah, but that's the one I chose anyhow. You can choose one that's from the 1900s, or you can choose a, another one. Or, or maybe should the Lord Jesus tarry, we will, be, we will be this in the same way. But I want us to look at D.L. Moody. Lived, born in 1837. In the, he's a, he was American. Um, his ministry was in the U.S. and the U.K. And um, 1837 to 1899, I did find one very, very grainy picture of him standing in front with a crowd. Um, but because he, he lived and died such a long time ago, it was hard to find many pictures of his great crusades and his great, so, uh, great uh, um, meetings and ministry. So I, I took a picture and said, and you say, I don't, we look at this and we think, because you know, he was a great evangelist. Maybe we look at this and we think, I don't believe that. Well, in his lifetime, he preached at times and often to crowds of 10 to 20,000 people at one time. 10 to 20,000. Now, I don't know about you, I don't understand that because there were no microphones at that time. No microphones. How did he do it? How did he do it? I don't know, but I think God must have helped him. So I want us to look, as we're thinking about devotion, the one thing, I want us to look at the life of D.L. Moody. And, and some of us know some things about him. Most people consider D.L. Moody the greatest evangelist of the 19th century. Most, most do. And he won, oh, so many people to the Lord. He preached tirelessly. And some of us might look at, his, at him, and we know, I know you're freezing, aren't you? So it'll keep you awake. You're awake, aren't you? You're not sleepy, right? There you go. Sit close to your brothers and sisters. You'll be okay. There we go. And um, look at D.L. Moody. Forget being cold. Look at D.L. Look at D.L. Moody. So we look at D.L. Moody, and when we consider his life and what a great evangelist he was, some of us probably think he had a really great life, right? He must have had what a Christian foundation he had. He must have had a strong family. He must have had a devout Christian upbringing. He must have had a deep seminary or theological training. Um, he must have, who knows what advantages he had to live the life that he, that he lived to have such devotion. In fact, Moody was born into a family that in the end had nine children, nine children. His father was a bricklayer and an alcoholic. And his father died when he was 41 years old. Nine children. Um, his mother was pregnant with twins and the twins were born a month after the father died. Nine children, a single mother, very, very poor. The father had been an alcoholic. They were, they attended a church, but in the church that they attended, they did not preach that you could be saved, that you needed to be saved through Jesus. It was just, a, it was a religious, it was a congregational church at that time. He wrote books and founded Bible colleges, but his education did not go past the fifth grade. Okay? So this is the background of D.L. Moody. He had terrible grammar and terrible smell, spelling. How, how many of you think my spelling's not very good? D.L. Moody had terrible grammar and spelling, and his manners were kind of rough because he was only, in fact, his mother uh, sent him out of the home to live with other people to work so that he'd have, he would have enough food to eat at, with some of the other children. So that was his background. He moved when he was 17 years old to the city of Chicago so that he could work as a shoe salesman just to make his own way. 
and he began to go to a church there. Um, the, he lived with an uncle, and the uncle's rule was, if you come and live with me and work in my shoe store, you must go to the church that I go to. And so D.L. Moody started going to church. Let me tell you what his Sunday school, his youth teacher said about him. This was before he had become a Christian, before God had changed his heart. He said, I have never seen one whose mind is as spiritually dark as Moody's mind. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? And the, the Sunday school teacher said he would try to read the Bible and he couldn't understand it. He only had a fifth grade education. So this was his background. Those are the early years of evangelist D.L. Moody. And then after he'd been working about a year in the, in the, in the uh, shoe store, his Sunday school teacher that said that about him walked into the store and just said very directly to him, his name was Dwight, Dwight L. Moody, Dwight, give Jesus your life, accept him as your savior. And very simply, Dwight Moody did. He just became a Christian and his life was transformed. He began to serve the Lord. He had a great heart for God and he began evangelizing. He had a heart for children and he began reaching Sunday school children. He had a heart for uh, social work as well and he would help poor people. He began to be involved in the YMCA and he began teaching in the YMCA. He was doing many, many things, all of them good for the Lord. He was telling people about God and then in 1871 in Chicago, and he was already preaching by that time and he was a pastor by that time as well. He was doing so many different things and in 1871 there was a huge fire in Chicago. It was called the Great Fire of, uh, the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. It's just some American history and much of the city burned. You know what burned at that time? His church and the YMCA where he worked in Chicago. And so let me tell you a little bit more about his life. Everything that he'd done, all of these things, were burned. And so, it was in October 1871, he thought, what will I do? I have to rebuild the mission church, and his home was burned down as well. His, his house was burned down as well, and the YMCA where he ministered. And so he traveled to New York City to raise funds to rebuild the church and the YMCA. In his, bi in his biography, and in, in it's recorded in his biography, that he was walking down Wall Street in New York City. And as he was walking down Wall Street, the power of the Holy Spirit gripped his heart in a very wonderful, a very powerful way. And he said he felt what he described as a presence and a power as he had never known before. And it was so strong that he cried out loud, Hold, Lord! It is enough! The power of God gripped his heart so strongly. From that point on, he decided to devote his life to one thing. One thing. And he went back to Chicago and he decided, if the world is going to be changed and people are going to be reached, it's not through all of the social work, although those things are go good. It is going to be through evangelizing the world in this generation. And in Moody's life, this one thing I do became a reality to him. In the 40 years that Moody ministered, it is estimated that he led how many people to the Lord? They're estimates, we don't know for sure. It is estimated that Moody led one million people to God. One million people. This is what can happen when you and I decide this one thing I do. This one thing I do. Now you may say, God has not called me to be an evangelist. That's fine. Maybe God has not called you to be an evangelist. But what has God called you to be? And if there is a devotion in your heart and a one thing in your life, God will do great things through you. Let's look at the next slide. Look, look at what D.L. Moody said. And I love this. I love this. Moody said, If this world is going to be reached, I am convinced that it must be done by men and women of average talent. How many of you would say, that's me? <laughs> average talent.
After all, there are comparatively few people in this world who have great talents. I know a few people who are great, don't you? I do. There are a few people I'd say, wow, they're really great. But honestly, brothers and sisters, the majority of Christians I know are average. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I don't mean that as a put down. I don't mean, ah, tohua, as we would say. I don't mean, ah, average. What I mean is there aren't that many people I know that are great. There are a few that I know that I look at and I say, that person is a great person when I look at their lives. But I love what he said. He said, if this world's going to be reached, it's going to be done by average people. If great things are going to be done by God, it's going to be average people that do them. And so I want to ask you this morning, how special are you? You would say, I'm not so special. How educated are you? Well, D.L. Moody had a fifth grade education. Everybody in here right now has had more education than D.L. Moody. Yes? Yes, we've all had more edu education than he has. How privileged are you? Mm. Single mother, alcoholic father who died, farmed out to work at an early age, fifth grade education. How gifted are you? How wealthy are you? Those are not the questions that we should ask ourselves. The question we should ask ourselves is, how devoted am I? How devoted am I? Do I have a one thing mentality? How will you live the life God has called you to live? One of the ways will be through a dissatisfaction. Another way will be through a devotion, a one heart. There's one thing I do. There's one thing I do. And all of those other things you do, they will still be part of your life, but they will fit in the right priority in your life. They'll fit in the right priority in my life. Do you know, as a pastor, there are some things, there are, are, there are times when we are called to do things. Would you come do this? Would you come do that? Would you go do that? And all of these things. And there are sometimes things I would like to do let me tell you something this morning. There are things that I don't even tell you about that I say no to. There are invitations I say thank you but no. Why? Because I know the calling of God on my life. God has called me to be your pastor. God has called me to encourage the church our church and those, uh, those the, the ministries and the outreaches that we have within a, a limited sphere. Within a, it, it, it's, a, it's a limited sphere. If God opens other doors and the Holy Spirit says, yes, go do that, I'll go do that. But I have a focus, the calling of God. And that's what I want to give myself to. Because if I fail in that area, if I give less in that area, that I am, then I am not fulfilling the call of God in my life. Though I may be doing many, many good things. Many, many good things. And that should be true for each one of us. Truly, brothers and sisters, every decision we make, every opportunity we have, the balance should always be, God, does this fit with your calling on my life? Does it fit into the priorities that you have for me? Every one of us should answer that in our own lives. And if we do, we will live the lives God has called us to live. Does it mean that I will only do one thing in my life? No, it doesn't mean that. You will do other things. There will be other things that are part of your life. Look at the life of D.L. Moody. If you follow his life, he wrote books. He started Bible colleges. He started a, uh, a girl's uh, uh, college um, in, a, in a particular area. He started churches. Uh, and in fact, even today, Moody Bible College, maybe it's Moody Seminary now, I'm not, I'm not sure. There's even a publishing, there's even a publishing company, Moody, Moody Publishing Company, for his, his works or whatever. All of the, these things were part of his life. But he had a priority, and his priority was evangelizing. And out of that, a million people, a million people led to the Lord from somebody who was very, very ordinary, wasn't he? Very, very ordinary when we look at his background. But 
He had a devotion in his life. He had a devotion in his heart. And when you and I find from God, God, your purpose in my life is this. Your calling in, in my life is this. And that's our focus then everything else will fall into place. Pastor John, last week uh, in the anniversary, he, t he gave us the two examples of the two trees, and he talked about flourishing, right? Remember that? He talked a fair bit about flourishing. Listen, brothers and sisters, do you want your life to flourish, to, to follow on with what Pastor John was talking about last week? If you want your life to flourish, get a devotion. Have a devotion. Say one thing I do, and I will tell you something. The one thing you do will not restrict you. It will not restrict you, but it will focus you so that what you do will be productive for the Lord. I think as we come to a close this morning, and we will uh, next week we'll do the last uh, we'll do the, the last points. I think of a river, and this is, a, for me, this is a good analogy, as we think of a devotion, we think of one thing. How many of you uh, have been around a swamp before? Been around a swampy area before? Usually, I have, and in fact, in, there's, there's a, uh, in, in my part of the country where I live in the U.S., there are swamps. Do you know where swamps, you, what usually causes a swamp? Usually. It's usually a river that is low and wide without boundaries and it just spreads out it just spreads out and everything gets swampy but when that river is contained when there are boundaries when there are controls on that river rather than spreading out every way instead it's brought in then the power and the potential of that river is harnessed and great things can be done with the power of that river with the power of the water that flows through brothers and sisters this is what God wants for our life for our lives let there be a holy dissatisfaction let there be a devotion a one thing a one thing I cannot tell you what your one thing is I can't but the Holy Spirit can. He can give you the priority for your life because God is the one who's called you. I haven't called you. I haven't called you. I haven't said, Junior, come serve the Lord and do this. No, no. God has called you. God has called you. You get with Him and let Him give you, let Him give you the focus for your life the devotion, the priority for your life. If God could take an orphan, uneducated, darkened mind, poor, terrible background, and make of him the greatest evangelist of the 19th century, whew, that gives me encouragement for my own life, then God can do something with me. And God can do something with you to do great things for Him. Not because we're great, but because He's great. And God uses ordinary people of average talent who are devoted to Him. Let's close in prayer. Lord, just as we thanked you for the life of Eric Little a few weeks ago, God, we thank you that you looked on D.L. Moody, so lacking in talent, so rough, so unpolished, so average, and really, Lord, so below average, really below average. But God, you grabbed his heart, and he grabbed you, and out of him, out of him, oh God, he helped to populate heaven with your message. A million people there today instead of in hell that we're going to meet one day. God, I pray that you would help us as average people in this life, in this time, in this century, in this generation. May we hear your voice calling us. May we live lives in the balance that are worthy. May we do what you've called us to do, be what you've called us to be 
as we devote ourselves to you. May we say of our lives, one thing I do, one thing I do. And then, Lord, let you work and do what you have planned to do in our lives. Whatever we are this morning, whatever our circumstances, whatever our backgrounds, good or bad, our history, broken or beautiful, our education, high or low, our pockets, full or empty, we devote ourselves to you. One thing we do, one thing we do, help us to press on in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.